Welcome to the April 2022 meeting of the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel meeting. Um, we will do introductions, but I'd like to do them a little differently because there's someone who I would like to introduce to everyone. Um, who I, I was going to say, if you look at the square, which doesn't mean a thing, in any event, um, on our call is Grant Taylor. And Grant is our new, he is basically <laughs> the secretary of the panel, people. Like, he's going to take notes and keep order and things of that nature. And yes, you are, Grant. Just say yes. And um, we are very, we are very fortunate to have him. It's been a while. Um, Aaron helped enormously in getting this set up. Um, and I just wanted to let you all know who he is. And other than that, uh, I, Grant, do you want to, I don't know, is there something you'd like to tell us about yourself or anything? I, just, that I mean, I just want to say that um, I've been interested in the work y'all are doing for, you know, over five years, and I just feel super privileged to be able to work with you guys a little bit now. Really. Well, yeah. welcome and thank you. <laughs> Can I just say uh, something also? Grant, sure. thank you. So glad you're here. So very glad. Um, Aton, I did not put in his contract that he's keeping us in order. So not oh, that okay. It. And it's not possible anyway, so don't worry, Grant. <laughs> uh, also, don't take an example from me on dissemination of the minutes, which was to Aton yesterday late afternoon. Don't do that. Um, sorry, Aton, and to the group for getting those out so late, and maybe we can all review them before the next meeting. And what I will do is I didn't want to send them out to everyone what turned out at about one o'clock this afternoon, that just felt really evil. So I withheld them. I will send them out tomorrow. Uh, we're just going to let it go tonight. We And as Aaron says, yeah, we can just review them and do it all for our next meeting. Great. But Thank I didn't want to just, sure. I didn't want to just give you, great. So let a, let me go down the list and everybody can introduce themselves. Uh, Abigail Crocker. Hi, I'm Abby Crocker. I'm at the University of Vermont. Thank you. Tyler. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tyler <laughs> Allen. I'm the commissioner designated appointee um, for uh, Department for Children and Families. Uh, Chief Stevens. Hi, Don Stevens, uh, Chief of the Nohegan Abenaki Tribe and Executive Director of Abenaki Help in Abenaki. Any slides down mountains? Uh, <laughs> Chris, Chris Loris. Yeah, Christopher Loris, uh, Research Associate, Crime Research Group here on the behalf of Karen Gannett and Dr. Robin Joy. Full disclosure, I'm also an appointee to the Criminal Justice Council. Thank you. Susanna. Hello, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Great. Jen Firpo. Hi, Jen Firpo, Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. Great. Uh, Aaron. Hi, good evening. Aaron Jacobson, Attorney General's Office, Community Justice Division. Great. Jessica, and it's good to see you. I wasn't expecting you. Hi, everyone. Um, unfortunately, I won't be here long. I uh, double booked. Um, but um, this is Jessica Brown. She, her, I'm a visiting professor of criminal law at Vermont Law School and a former public defender and an appointee to the RDAP. Thanks. Great. Captain Kessler. Hello, Barb Kessler, and I am co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing with Vermont State Police, along with Aton. Evan. Hello, my name is Evan Meenan, and I work for the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Okay. Elizabeth Morris. 
Elizabeth Morris. I'm the Juvenile Justice Coordinator at FSD and DCF. Thank you. Pepper. Hey, uh, it's James Pepper. Um, I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board, just uh, coming to you as a visitor today. Great. Ching. Ching Ren, Evaluation and Program Analyst at Shelburne Farms. Thank you. Sheila. Uh, Sheila Linton, she, her pronouns, uh, community member appointed by the Attorney General and representing the Root Social Justice Center. Great. Julio. I am Julio Thompson, Civil Rights Unit, the Attorney General's office. I'm also here mm -hmm. as a visitor because Aaron is our office representative on RDAP. Great. Thank you. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner from the Office of the Defender General and um, panel member. Great. And I guess I, I am going to be very embarrassed. I don't know how to pronounce V-R-J-A Gale. <laughs> it's good. Uh, it's the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Um, Gale. Well, <laughs> isn't that funny? <laughs> I could have guessed that. Thank you. Um, is there anyone whom I've missed? This is your moment. This is, yep. Yeah, uh, this is Wichi. I do pronounce he, him, his. I am a data systems expert and a social justice advocate appointed by Susanna Davis. And why I always miss Wichi, I do not know, but this is like the fourth time. <laughs> Wichi, I, I am sorry. I'm, it's all good. I'm just that special, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> You're just not on the list. I don't know. Who else did I miss? It's me, Monica Weber from the Department of there Corrections. There you are. Hi. <laughs> oh, I know who I missed. Judge Zone. I don't think you scroll it down to those of us who are at the end of the alphabet. We're always just, no one loves us anymore. No, no, no. I it just doesn't it doesn't go there. Oh, <laughs> look at that. No, never never I've got something weird. Anyway, well, you're on Tom's <laughs> Tom's own a chief superior judge. Thank you. Oh God. All right. Well, I've done this well tonight. Uh anyone else? Okay, great. Um, there, a couple things, there are announcements. Um, first off, I, normally we don't have new business, but we do tonight. There are two issues that, um, are, we need to bring up. One, um, Witchy, you, you don't know this, but you, you brought up a really great thing in your email about making some invitations to people who were connected to the Brattleboro report. Um, and so I thought we should discuss that. Um, what was the second issue? There's another one. It will come to me. Oh, I know. Um, Pepper is here to talk about a request, a possible request from the Cannabis Control Board. Um, so those two things we'll have for new business. So. When we're done discussing, don't don't just jump up and leave. Witchy, go ahead. Yeah, there was something that also jumped out at me that I'd like to talk about, and I don't have to take up a lot of time, but um, on page two, there was a talk about the um, traffic stops and data collection, and I recently met with the with Sheriff Anderson from Wyndham County, um, and I've noticed some weird stuff on data, so I just wanted to maybe seek a little space to ask questions about it. Great. OK. Thank you. Cool. So we'll do that at new business. If that's all right with you to do it then? OK, good. Um, then the last announcement that I would have, actually, I would cede this to Erin about per diem payments for community members. Erin, can you do your you like are a wizard at this, so I just thought I'd let you, I mean, you you got witchy his money. God knows that was like, 
pulling teeth. So I thought I'd leave this to you. Well, thank you. I don't think I'm a wizard. It's just bureaucracy um, that we have to keep up with. So for those of you who are non-state employees or not paid to be at these meetings through your employment, you can get reimbursed um, at the rate of, uh, it's a, the per diem rate is $50. But in order to get that money, you need to fill out um, a reimbursement form and then email it to me. Then I approve it. Then it goes to my business office. Then my business office should send you a check. That's how it's supposed to go. If there's a delay, please don't hesitate to bother me about it and I can check on it. Um, I did give everybody the reimbursement form via email um, earlier, no, last week, Wednesday, April 6th, um, upon a request from Sheila Linton for that form. Um, but it, if anyone wants me to send it again or perhaps paste it into the chat, I can do that. And if you, anyone has any questions, like, I can try to answer those as well. Okay, thank okay. you. Great. And then um, moving right along to the real body of the um, meeting, which is a discussion of, first of all, that wonderful document that the, I, I have no good name for the quote unquote subcommittee. I just kind of went the Jessica Rebecca Zuzana subcommittee. <laughs> They were looking at the report that we wrote in 2019. Um, pardon? Pardon? Okay. Um, and they were looking at that to, again, discuss future directions for us. Um, uh, you should know that, I mean, Evan and I were a different little subcommittee and we were looking at um, our obligations that, that were written into the enabling statute for the panel as a whole. We sort of backed off on that because there was feeling, if you remember last month, that we were spending a lot of time focusing on law enforcement. So the um, JRX subcommittee um, presented us with this truly wonderful compendium, I have to say, this document that just kind of goes through all of the issues that not only were came up in the 2019 report, but that have come up since then around the state in a variety of documents. Um, I just want to take a moment here to just publicly say to the three of you, thank you. I mean, really deeply, deeply thank you. This is really magistral. I, it, it's just, it's very concise. It's very organized. I love the links. It's just, it's all right here. Um, I hope people have had time to consider it, and I'm going to cede the floor to the JRX committee to um, lead us through this and talk through where we go. So there you are, you guys. Susanna, is, is Jessica already gone? I think she is. Sorry to miss her. She unfortunately said she had double booked and she only had like 20 minutes at most. Yes. All right. So, uh, Susanna, do you want to give through the introductory remarks about this or, or do you want me to? Um, I don't know the one. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, pretty much um, it, very straightforward, pretty much the same thing that, that Eitan said. Um, Rebecca actually was the chief organizer of this effort and we just pulled together uh, recommendations and also ancillary, uh, I don't know, dicta or whatever from different reports um, that were relevant to the RDAP subject matter 
expertise. And so what we ended up with was a collection of recommendations that had been made from other working groups and from this working group, but also a bit of a nod to other topics as well, like for example, school discipline or language access, which are some ongoing work streams that may not have come directly from report recommendations, but that are relevant and are being worked on right now. So that's that's what you see. There's also a lot of links directly to those source materials. And, um, and, and believe it or not, the recommendations listed are not even all of them. We just didn't wanna overwhelm you. So some of them are just summarized, but um, yeah, that's that's what I got. And I would add too that um, certainly this list isn't comprehensive. And um, if for those of you who went through this and were like, wait, what about that one and that one? I was hoping to see that one. Like, please, after tonight, um, send, send them to Aitan, send them to, to me, to, to Zuzana, to all of us, so that we can consider this sort of a working document. I, I think the experience I had sort of working on this subcommittee this past month and sort of our efforts were a, again, our objective was if RDAP is, is next, is looking up, you know, we've just done this fabulous data project on the shelf, right? What, what, where do we want to land in terms of addressing racial disparities in the criminal juvenile court systems? Well, it made sense to us, of course, to look at our previous recommendations. Um, it was interesting because you know, our work at the time in 2019, we came up with those recommendations. I certainly felt like there were not a lot of people out there thinking about these things and in a way that we were as a panel in terms of producing reports of sort of that policy level scale, big system level scale in Vermont on race. What was exciting with this project was to see how many more have been thinking here in Vermont right? Our allies, people who are here tonight, I uh, tried to send out uh, invitations of our meeting tonight to the people, to the reports we've included here. Um, if they're not here, I know they were excited to have their reports uh, included here. And I like that effort of sort of building upon recognizing our work within so much uh, other organizations and, and activists, um, community groups, just so many more. I didn't even get the interfaith um, Interfaith Alliance just produced something on on community building and working with law enforcement from from the county level in Vermont, and they just did that last week. So so please consider this like a, a work. I I think it's very in, not comprehensive, but I think as Susanna pointed out, what we tried to do was organize them based on categories. It's it's not a perfect fit, as you'll see. Some of them overlapped. Some of those. Um, We've been we've had presentations from CSG through the Justice Reinvestment um, Project Reinvestment Two recommendations. You'll see in that chart we split them up based on their recommendations into the sections. I, I think before we maybe dive in, and I don't know how you want to talk about it. I, I wanted to share some over, like some overarching themes that I picked out. Is that is that okay? Um, you know, you talked, Dayton, that you and Evan sort of realize that like we've, we've been focusing so much on police. What I, my takeaway of looking at the comprehensive takeaways of the recommendations, the work, uh, the conclusions is that you can't remove law enforcement from the equation, that any focus of any next drop down project would be incomplete. Um, and so that was a, a, a takeaway. In fact, when I started seeing how, the, how um, jumping to the decriminalization category, uh, approach and really it was finding the work recently done in the Massachusetts criminal court system, working with the Harvard folks. I don't know if you guys saw that report. They pulled together sort of some concepts around addressing racial disparities by addressing the criminal code itself uh, and looking at the various ways that that can be done. I thought that took in a way a lot of different pieces um, and put them in a framework that you could see how many different layers are involved. Again, um, addressing both uh, direct contact, initial contact into the system, that's often law enforcement, police, right? And then how do you deal with the charging, charging discretion of police officers? There are individual prosecution offices that are 
are implementing their own policies to effectively do a de facto decriminalization of their localities, right? Whether it's Chittenden um, or Massachusetts, now she's the U.S. attorney, uh, Rachel Rollins, others, right? Then there is at the legislative level, we are seeing efforts this year through sentencing commission's work where Judge Zone is uh, the chair and I'm vice chair. And we've done, talked about that work of, of reclassifying uh, criminal code um, offenses to put them into different sentencing schemes to lower the maximum um, of effect is to lower the maximum sentences in many instances. There is an H505 bill that's going through the legislature on drugs that is, uh, I think, a direct result, I think, of CSG's recommendations to the legislature, which was when after they presented that racial disparities report, uh, finding the drug offenses, prosecutions, and charging rates in this state being extraordinarily high, 14 time full difference for black defendants to be charged with felony drug offenses in this state, as opposed to white defendants, 14 times more likely to just be charged with drug offenses. So the legislature took that and looked at the drug offenses and applying that reclassification concept to to dropping maybe some felonies to misdemeanors or lowering the misdemeanor the sentencing um, schemes. So I thought that was interesting to see sort of pieces that we have seen in various groups in Vermont, policy committee levels, and also in other states where it's coming together. Um, but the Massachusetts report was interesting because the, their point was this, any one target just wasn't enough. The ones, the jurisdictions, the states that have, are ahead of us in decriminalizing certain types of offenses, they still see racial disparities coming up. Uh, and so the current recommendation from that Harvard study out of Massachusetts was that you can't try to target just sort of the lowering sentences or declination of prosecution whether it's individual prosecution offices or objective criteria that prosecution offices stand without also getting to the heart of it because police will still stop. And that was looking at uh, Dr. Sanguino's recent reporting, right, from 20, uh, the, the COVID uh, traffic sure. stop yeah. drops, right? And that confirmed what's happening elsewhere. Even if the stops drop, the dis racial disparities within still exist, right? So I think there it's it's an interesting confirmation of of the the very critical important data that we're seeing in little pockets is being confirmed in other jurisdictions. So I'll stop there. I want to share those those highlights for me. Anyone? I I have to say I was really delighted that the non consensus recommendations made it in because a lot of what was in everything, it, it felt like in some ways those were umbrellas. And I was just sort of struck by that, just going through it slowly, that those recommendations that we as a group came up with, um, which it's really kind of amusing to me in a way, because some of it was pretty contentious when we were coming up with it. And now I think a few years later, it's not looking quite as contentious, at least if we look broadly at the United States. Um, so I, I was sort of focused, I was personally intrigued with, um, and I don't know why I would go here first. I, there's no reason for this. I was particularly moved by the idea of expanding the list of offenses that qualified for diversion. Um, I, I, I'm, I think partly that comes from a lot of work that I've been doing with people who are involved in restorative justice and such, who are concerned with that right now. And that sort of struck me as somewhere to go um, in terms of next steps for us. But I'll just stop there. Others? Aaron? 
Erin, you're muted. I just want to echo Aton's gratitude for the three of you putting this together because I'm kind of new to the scene and I just keep getting this feeling like so much work has been done and, and there's so much work being done and so many different groups thinking about so many different ways to keep moving the work forward. But it just seems so kind of like, in my mind, hard to keep track of. And um, this is just so helpful. And it's I really also appreciate your thought, Rebecca, that this could be a living document. And so it's just kind of this beginning of this compendium that we have that we can add to. Um, I love that idea. The one thing that I noticed that's not in here, or maybe I just missed it, um, was there's a lot of um, recommendations and work that's gone into thinking about the, the front end of the criminal justice system, like enforcement, policing, um, changing the criminal code, defelonizing, decriminalizing, making more crimes, diversion eligible, that kind of thing. And I, I love that. Good. Let's do that. Yes. But also I'm thinking about like, what about all the harm that's already been done and thinking about people that are, you know, enduring long prison sentences. Um, and what about efforts to get some second look legislation in Vermont, thinking about clemency or pardons, those kinds of efforts on the other end of the criminal justice spectrum. Um, and I'm not trying to like add to everyone's plates. It's just, a, it was just something that I noticed um, wasn't in the document or maybe I just didn't see it. Okay. Thank you. Chief um, Stevens. I just wanted to... Oh, sorry. Who did I interrupt? Oh, it, I'm so sorry. I know you're probably calling it Sheila. I switched over to the to my phone. Um, I'm sorry, Chief. Did you want to go before me? I I know I I can't see people's hands, so I no no no. Go ahead, go ahead, Sheila. <laughs> all, all all I wanted to say was that yes, ditto to what you just said. Like, how do we move forward without recognizing the harm that we've done, and where do we set in those policies or those um, apologies or, or what do we do about that? Because I think that's a real issue is that, you know, this has come about with like the marijuana laws, right? That there's yay. Now that a bunch of white people can profit it off of marijuana, all the black people who are incarcerated are what's happening with them. And so I really, really like this point. And I know that it might be an addition to what we already have, um, in the documents, but I, I feel very strongly about that last point that, um, I, I didn't catch who said that. Thanks, Sheila. Chief. Yeah, I was just going to echo what Sheila was just saying. She she just basically was um, saying what I what I was thinking was that, especially with uh, and maybe it's a more of a, a question for Pepper is that we know many states have legalized marijuana. We know that you know Vermont's you know going through this whole process, which will have growers um, you know and how do we look at the people who have been penalized over the years? Um, and also because it is uh, illegal through the feds, but it's, it's not through the state. Like where's that line of, you know, has the kind of the feds kind of look and they're going to look the other way based on other people who have legalized it. And, or are they going to just, if you get caught, they're going to, compound it with a federal charge instead of a state charge. I mean, where's, I don't know where all that mixture comes in when it comes to what we're trying to do in Vermont compared to the federal, what the federal people are doing. And if they're just kind of deferring to the state in our process to kind of go through um, this whole process, especially around marijuana and other types, like Sheila was just saying, how do we how do we go back and do things and also protect people in the future going forward? So um, that, that was just a question. Oh. Rebecca? Uh, I love it, Erin and Sheila and Chief. The, um, 
that is a huge gap in this that I realized after sending this out. I was like, wait. And and it's funny. <laughs> and 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 Judge Senator will probably be chuckling because I'm I'm heading up a subcommittee on second look legislation on the sentencing commission. <laughs> and so it's just the nature of these things where it's just like oh, the deadlines and much. So second look being uh, of course for others who may not be as familiar as the how we term the term of terms of art of this second look sort of a. a a broad way to think about the various ways that um, legislatures are currently thinking about building into uh, this post-sentencing, how to build in literally a second look after you've been sentenced, uh, you know, tweaking current laws that already have that, right? We have a sentence reconsideration statute right now that permits within 90 days of um being sentenced in a, in a conviction and sentence becoming final, you can submit a motion for sentence reconsideration. There are lots of ways that that can be tweaked to be actually a, a, a more robust look, right? Because is it, you know, what what can you look at? Is 90 days unbreakable? Can we think about expanding that, right? What are the standards of review? What can be considered at that small period? Then there are uh, other states that are implementing particularly for the longer sentences. In fact, they're targeting the super long sentences of putting in mandatory looks at certain stages once you're so many years in. Um, and whether or not those second looks require, happen automatically or have to happen um, with the prompting and filing by the person incarcerated, right? So there's lots of different ways that we can look into if we, if, if there, if, if we wanna look into it, uh, certainly sentencing commission know that we're looking into and trying to develop um, recommended language for the legislature to consider. And I almost see a wonderful marriage here of similarly interested panel members working with the subcommittee on sentencing uh, commission. Because right now that is, um, I think, Evan, you're on that, I believe, and, and Rory Tebow, um, and I forget who else. Um, and so there's that. The other ways that you can look at, at at correcting the harm, right? Because you're right, that just addresses people who are not yet in the system. Um, expungement efforts, and, and the legislature certainly, and Aaron knows, grappling with expungement uh, review and, and tweaking our current laws. We can always, we can jump in and weigh in what we think, right, as a panel, what we think, how the land should particularly land. There are a lot of people who have already brought their viewpoints um, to the table, many of them here on this panel, but we certainly as a panel member can do that. And that's so important how to start over, right? Who can look at it? Um, and then I think the justice reinvestment, two recommendations amongst them were uh, related to sort of a second look concept, but not just for the incarcerated, but for people who are on probation. Uh, Monica, I don't know, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if you have anything else, and there to throw uh, in on that side of the house. Well, I think on the probation one, the second look, I believe you were talking about is what they're doing for the midpoint probation reviews, right? So, and they they did change that statute last year and they're actually modifying it again this year. So, you know, that's in progress. Um, and there have been people who have had their probation reviewed at their midterm <clears throat> and Evan and Judge Zoni and other people have been involved in the uh, revision of that as well as the Department of Corrections. Okay. Witchy. All right, so I'm gonna take you like through my train of thought to sort of help give context to my question. So I'm gonna take off my RDAP hat for a second, put on my former hat. So um, one of the things sort of like, uh, you know, as, as Chief Stevens is talking, that sort of came up to my brain is like um, all the nitty gritty details that come with like the different policy decisions that we make and sort of the unintended consequences. Like, for example, um, you know, like growing personal weed and getting NRCS money is like all of a sudden if we, it, it, there are, because it, it's sort of federal that 
and they're sort of like federal guidelines and I have to like, it actually costs more money now for me to produce like, you know, stuff like weed or, so, or different stuff like that. So it's just like thinking about like, who am I, who could I complain that to, right? Like, who do I talk to about that, especially as like this farmer in this like small 400 person town. Um, so taking that hat off, putting back the RDAP hat. So I want, a, a, like, I'm very curious if we, if we have sort of like a, a sister organ, uh, a sister advisory panel or um, a sub-working group, and maybe Susanna and Rebecca, maybe this is what you're doing, but really thinking uh, about what are the policy decisions that we've helped push for? What was the intended impact, right? Doing that impact analysis uh, and sort of are were those the... Uh, did it actually have those impacts and what were the impacts it didn't have? And are there channels for people on the ground that are impacted by this policy? to have, be able to give us feedback so then we can keep thinking about where are all the different holes instead of just like pat, like going off to like new policies and forgetting about the old ones, making sure that we close the loopholes and patches uh, on things that we've done that didn't have the intended consequences or having nitty gritty details cause more barriers for people. Chief? Um, I want to say one more thing to Rebecca when it comes to the second chance thing. Um, I'm not sure if you're thinking about this, but I think if things slip through the crack, maybe a mandatory review at parole time, like if somebody's going up for parole, uh, you know, that it's mandatory review of these types of second chance policies that because because they don't have to do that. Right. But maybe it should be something written that, you know, not only do they look at expungement or or diversion, but if people are already in jail and um, and they come up for, you know, parole or some other things that it doesn't just get denied and moved on to the next year <laughs> or there's some look. So I just wanted to at least mention that if it hasn't been. So thanks. I have a thought slash question. It might um, sound kind of funny, um, but you know how um, employers have to hang up those laws, like labor law things in your office? Couldn't we have those things with, within the incarceration system, like in the jails that say, like, when a new law pops off, it goes into a nice poster that's huge where everybody has to see it to let you know, basically, these are your rights. Guess what? We've legal, and if you were arrested, you might want to check into this. Is there some kind of tool such as that that we could also be creating to inform inmates that um, things are shifting and things are changing and what their rights might be with regards to the shifting either in policy or law? I imagine so. Anybody else? I know, Witchy, wait one minute. I just want to finish up on this. Does anyone want to weigh in on that who's actually well, I mean, working in the criminal justice system. I mean, I'll say there's, you know, there's certainly lots of efforts um, that have happened within a, an incarcerative setting on a variety of topics. For, and I'm going to use voting as an example, right? So a lot of people um, may not recognize that they have the right to vote. And so when election cycle comes around, a lot of times there are volunteers who will come into correctional facilities and help people register to vote, right? And I think like there's a, so there's mechanisms like that for people to come in. And then there's also ways in which the department distributes information um, to people throughout the system, including tablets. Um, we, we can push out memos and information. Yeah. Every, if you want in a tablet, you can have a tablet. You're not required to have a tablet, but, you know, people get tablets and that's how they we can send memos or information or letters to people as well. Sheila, this is Rebecca. Uh, to, to just add to what Monica said and to answer your question from, uh, again, I'm not an attorney in the Prisoner's Rights Office, but um, my understanding is what you are proposing or what you're suggesting isn't done uh, right now, which is what I'm hearing you is like is 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 relevant new legislation or laws that come in like right is it posted somewhere publicly by DOC? Uh, not that I were. Is it available otherwise? If there's some digging in the law library, if you know if and when you can get there, yes. 
right? Is there is it possible to be able to consult with, uh, you know, an attorney at the prisoner's rights office or to talk with an investigator about some questions? Yes, but your specific question, right? Is, is no, I don't think there is anything like that. I think it's a great idea. How to get the word out, right? Sort of a, a, a newsletter. Monica, are you following up on this? <clears throat> I am following up if you go will, for it. Allow then. That. Sure. Yeah, which I think these are you know, really great and interesting ideas um, that the Department of Corrections can certainly work with people on. And, you know, recent example when because justice reinvestment has been brought up a few times here, justice reinvestment had um, an enormous impact on people who were being incarcerated. And we, we did, and so maybe this is a lesson for us to learn, um, create documents that we then were able to either post in units or push out on tablets for people to say, hey, this is what this statute means. There was a lot of conversation around earned time and how earned time was going to work and, you know, so why people could get it and not get it. And we had to, you know, explain all of that in materials and we were sent that out to people so that they had the information. Um, and so, um, there are situations where that's happened, and it seems like we should start to create more situations for that to happen. Witchy. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry to uh, switch out of this topic, but I'm just. I'm. Uh, I asked a question. I don't think it. Um, it got caught. So uh, I'm wondering what kind of feedback mechanism exists for us with the policies that we push. And I understand that we do like justice reinvestment, right? And we look at the big pictures, but I'm wondering if we do any like policy specific analysis on things that we've pushed and if they're having the, in the intended impact. Ah. I think that's probably partnership that's good for the racial equity office, especially the yeah. research and policy analyst. And also with maybe with DPS, um, only because I know that they already have a legislative team that does have a deep focus on matters related to DPS matters. So I think it's probably a combination of touch points for the RDAP. Okay, I appreciate that information. Can you clarify what DPS is? Yes, thank you. It is the Department of Public Safety. Thank you. So is Evan. there uh oh, oh sorry. It's just I have a follow-up question then. It's like that's that's good to know that there's like these different pieces that we can piece together, but someone needs to piece it together. And I'm and I'm guessing that what you're saying is your policy person slash team is the uh, people to piece out together and to be yeah. our go ahead yeah i would i would definitely say that um yeah i do think that that's one good person to um to to work to make these connections and i'm also now thinking of more people beyond us like i see evan's hand up and i'm thinking what about ago um the attorney general's office and the human rights commission um because there's a lot of high level policy analysis having to do with equity and uh, just outcomes that touch on criminal justice. And so I think your question is a great one. I don't know who is the, the central person to do that or to convene it. Maybe, um, maybe it's me, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, Evan. I was muted there for a minute. Uh, I think Witchy's point is a really good one because it will not only help the us, but also the legislature and the state as a whole understand whether past efforts have had the desired effect, but also what future efforts are warranted to address some of the issues that we all seem to be concerned about. I don't know if there is an entity that is doing this from like a qualitative uh, perspective, but I think that the department's hope has been that from a quantitative perspective, 
the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics would go a long way to doing some of this work, assuming that H 546 passes and that there's sufficient resources to enable that entity to do its job successfully. Um, so that I think is there's an opportunity there. But um, I also think that we need that my, my hope all along has been that that Bureau will also assist all of these other entities who will have to report out data to develop the capabilities to do that in a successful way, because the results are only going to be as good as the inputs. And if we have poor inputs, we're not really going to learn the things that we're hoping we will be able to learn. Let me take this moment to um, just address H546. Um, I should have done this in the announcements, but such, since it's come up here, this is a good moment. Um, I have been asked to testify in front of, remember, Senate Judiciary. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, tomorrow morning, in fact. Um, the information that was filtered to me after their last meeting had to do with um, a concern with the advisory panel that we proposed in the report that made it into the bill. Um, that there is sort of, we're back to, I mean, of course, crossovers happen. So it's kind of Groundhog Day. And now we're being asked again about why can't the RDAP do this? Um, I wanted you all to know that. Um, if you all have anything you want to uh, add into this, please let me know before nine o'clock tomorrow uh, morning. Um, I'm feeling pretty confident about knowing the position of the panel. Um, but that, I have been told, is coming up again tomorrow, um, that that is another issue about why we have to have yet another body when we have all of us who have nothing to do with our free time other than, um, you know, spend more time on data. So just wanted to say that with as little bitterness as possible. Evan. Yeah, I had a I had a bit of a chuckle today because I was listening to uh, Senate Government Operations talk about the bill. And Susanna, you were you were there, and I was watching your testimony. And um, some folks were talking about whether or not RDAP could fulfill this role. And I was just thinking about our conversation from our last meeting about how our existing legislative tasks are 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 big and demanding and we haven't even had time to tackle all of those yet given the time and other resources that we have available to us so you know we might be asked to take on this additional task which will force further difficult decisions about uh how we prioritize things that we're going to work on but but assuming we get this task, we should probably, you know, we, that that is going to dictate things to a degree. You know, how much are we going to be forced to refocus on the data component, which maybe we thought we had checked that box off of uh, before before turning to other items. But we, we might have some big questions we're going to have to answer in order to help the Bureau do its work. Thanks, Evan. Witchy. Uh, I would, I would uh, first as like a, a clarifying question, can you explain to me what kind of support you're looking for? Witchy, who's you? You, Aton. Thank you. Okay. Um, if, <laughs> Sorry, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I was like, is it the French vu or, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, what the support I'm looking for is, that's why I sort of said, this issue's coming up again. If you have a sense of just your own personal sense of 
what that feels like as a member of this panel to be um, required to fill this role, given the amount of time we have each month, um, given the work that we've done on data thus far. Um, and I would also say with reference to our enabling statute, um, I please send me a sentence, two sentences, a paragraph, something like that. And I, I, I have read peak things that people have written from this body in as testimony before and am perfectly jazzed to do it again because uh, we clearly have an issue here that's going to continue to come up. Um, I mean, what Evan's saying is, I, I, I kind of wish he didn't say it, but he's right. Um, <laughs> that I, I'm really sort of frightened by the, there seems to be a sense that we can do this. And I have said repeatedly over the last 18 months, um, not just on my own, but as chair of this body, we are not the RDAP that does data. That is not what we are. Um, we've been asked to address data. We've done that in my opinion, rather exhaustively, um, but we've got some people who don't agree. Go ahead, Witchy. And can you clar clarify for us when you say the advisory council, is this the council of uh, like directly impacted folks like victims of crime and, and stuff like that? Or you're talking about the, the, uh, the governance, uh, the other part? What I was told was the 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 uh, former. Sending you an email right now. I am looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. Anyway, that was a little bit of a digression, but it fit in at that moment, um, I think. So anyone? Rebecca. So um, moving off of that, I, I don't know if anyone else had wanted to talk about 546 before I did. All right. Um, Not that I see. We're almost an hour in, and I wanted to also highlight one more thing that we haven't talked about on this report, and, and you probably have seen it, but I wanted to highlight it for a different reason. Um, this is under, Susanna talked about this report, including sort of miscellaneous recommendations that we picked up here and there. Uh, and focusing specifically on access to justice. Um, and in there we have uh, language interpreters uh, and language issues, non-citizen issues, issues that have come up, you know, specific recommendations were different in our RDAP report in 2019, but we had touched down upon those subject areas in different ways. A new subject area that I wanted to make sure caught our eyes just to make sure we know and think, you know, it's it's a new issue, I think, for us, because we certainly, it wasn't there for us in 2019, and that is about access to justice and remote proceedings. And um, this is, there has been a lot, and I know that uh, the judiciary has certainly um, been spending a lot of time within with, with both having committees, bringing in a lot of the attorneys from, from different areas, practice areas, as well as internal and judge zone. Certainly, you know, I'd love to hear uh, you talk about that or to, to the extent you want to share. But what I wanted to highlight here uh, in terms of the context of how this intersects with disparities was how a recent report out, I think it was last month, March, um, thinking about how remote access to courts that have become the new norm, not just here in Vermont, but everywhere in the US uh, during the pandemic, how that has played out uh, for people who are um, you know, historically disadvantaged and for purposes of our panel, you know, the black and brown and, um, and BIPOC, uh, defendants, witnesses, 
complainants, victims, children, families, how all of, of, of the people who, who are impacted by the systems we're looking at, criminal juvenile justice systems, how, how remote proceedings have, have been for them, right? So much of the focus about remote proceedings is oftentimes about how it works for the attorneys or the judges, right? How, does, how is it actually working on the ground for people, um, well, certainly people who are sitting in jail pre-trial waiting for a hearing, or those who are not, or in civil cases waiting for their case to come up, right? And how has have their cases been prioritized? A lot of those, there's been a lot of focus on that. What this report looked at was the technology side of it and what it means when you know, do you have a computer? Do you have the broadband bandwidth to access the court systems? If there's funding available to support uh, households to get that kind of broadband to access the courts through this new remote system, you know, is accessing these these programs, these financial uh, assistance programs, uh, readily available? Um, even if you can access it and get it into your house, uh, do you have the technological wherewithal to do it, right? Do you know how to press the right button and, and access? <laughs> and, 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 and so the, the skills training the, and what it means at every layer of that and how it's compounded and, and, uh, and how it impacts these particularly communities, the BIPOC uh, communities in these systems. And I thought th that this report doesn't just focus on race, but the way that it focuses on the disparities of people who have traditionally been um, disadvantaged in these systems, how it actually has a, a direct effect on, on, on the people we are considering and, and looking at. So I just wanted to put that, that report at the forefront for us because we've never thought about uh, the remote court uh, system in the context of, of racial disparities. I want to add, I, 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 I want to put a couple people on the spot here. Um, one of the abiding concerns of our panel through, I mean, from the beginning, at least from my beginning of my tenure to now, has been a feeling that we have not done as good a job addressing the juvenile justice system as we have the adult criminal system. So what I would like to do right now is put both Tyler and Elizabeth on the spot and go, what are you not seeing? What are you seeing that does work? Um, I kind of just want to hear your feedback on that, given our history. Don't hate me too much. I could never hate you, Aton. <laughs> Thank you, <Tyler. laughs> um, So, yeah, yeah, I guess I didn't have as much time as I wanted to to kind of go through this over the weekend. Um, but I did kind of look through, and I think Elizabeth and I had a little bit of a conversation that it is relatively light um, when it comes to juvenile proceedings. It seems the emphasis is largely on criminal proceedings. Uh, and I think a lot of our conversation historically have been in that arena. I don't, I don't think I have an answer to your question right now about what I want to okay. see in that, but I, you know, already have made a note of that, that, you know, I need to be, Elizabeth and I could sit down, but uh, talk through a little bit more of where, where could we fill this out? What, what activities do we have that we could speak to that we maybe could add into this? Um, and so I love the, the concept of this being a living document because I think there could be, um, there could be some addition. Okay. Elizabeth, Great. do you have more concrete thoughts than I do at this point? I think the biggest thing that I would add is when it comes to the JJ system, historically, it's been really hard to um, grasp exactly how big of a disparity problem we have, given um, the court system data has historically a large percentage of unknown race and ethnicity for juveniles. Um, and my understanding is that that's stemming from the Form 101 um, that often does not have race or ethnicity filled out in that. Um, and 
I I guess my biggest recommendation, and I know we're not, as you were just saying, Aton, we're not the entity that does data. <laughs> so I will reference it before I continue. But um, I think it's hard sometimes to assess exactly where we have problems in the JJ system if we don't even have a a, a baseline um, in in gauging a lot of these pieces when it comes to the J when it comes to youth. Um, so that would be the very first thing. And I know that um, there's been some work um, in the family rules um, to perhaps give courts the ability to reject Form 101 if it doesn't have race and ethnicity filled out. Um, so that's the first thing off the top of my head, but I'm also happy to connect with, with Tyler and, and come up with some more concrete things. Um, in the report right. that will specifically speak to youth. One thing that I do just want to mention, and this is a super technical piece, so feel free to to tell me that I'm getting a little bit too in detail, but we do use the term offenders in this document, um, and I we just shouldn't be using that when talking about juveniles. Um, so I, I just want to preface that, that if, if that's the language we're going to use for the adults, we need to at least be adding in um, some additional language um, if we are talking about both systems. Got it. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, if if you do give it a look over, it would be really great to just plug stuff in because um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. All I know is that as I read through it, I had some concern about where where that was and where the where that uh, that being issues concerning the JJ system. So I just, if you're going to do that, I'm looking forward to it. Evan. Thanks, Eitan. I just, I had uh, several thoughts flowing into my head, listening to not only your comment, but Elizabeth's and Rebecca's. Um, uh, Elizabeth, in, re in regard to, to your comment about the Form 101, Dixon Corbett, who is uh, the Orange County State's Attorney and is on the Family Rules Committee, has recently flagged this for all of the state's attorneys to make sure that they do a better job of relaying race data to uh, the judiciary. And seeing as we're in the process of updating our case management system, we're having conversations internally about making those mandatory fields, the sort of do not pass go fields when you're filling out electronic forms to make sure that that data point is more consistently reported. So hopefully that will have an, uh, an, a positive effect on that front, um, both both of those two conversations. And then Re Re Rebecca, in terms of your con comment about uh, remote hearings, it, it reminded me of a, an effort in the legislature just recently, um, not, not directly involving defendants, but, but victims uh, and an effort to make it easier to apply for uh, ex parte relief from abuse orders remotely when the court is open in addition to when the court is closed. And so that, that comment from, from you in conjunction with your comment, Aton, made me realize that in all of these conversations, I think we, we perhaps need to do a better job of not necess not restricting our consideration to whether or not there's racial disparities when it comes to defendants in the criminal and juvenile justice system, but to also make sure that that victims are not being left out and that we 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 make sure that whatever data we're collecting and whatever qual qualitative uh, stories we collect, it's not just from from defendants involved in the system, but victims. You know, for example, mm -hmm. the victims have the same technological abilities that uh, we would want defendants to have in order to accurately and and consistently participate in court hearings, for a, for example. Okay, thank you, Tyler. Uh, really appreciate your comments there, Evan. Uh, especially that last comment, I was kind of snapping to. Um, I I would uh, follow up question to what you were just sharing around um, making sure some of those fields are mandatory uh, fields. Do you have a sense of um, 
where the data that would go into those fields, how that's acquired. And we've had some robust conversations internally at FSD. Is this something that we are asking people to report directly on, on their race? Are we making assumptions about what their race are based on how they look? Um, I'm, my only worry is if I have a state's attorney who's going to fill out a mandatory field because they need to advance forward on it, that if, if, if they don't have that data or they don't have the opportunity to ask the person their, you know, race questions that they will um, defer to other or some, or, you know, or, or just put white in or, or, or whatever that is. So uh, do you have any sense of that? It might be too detailed of a question. That's the exact question that I asked, uh, that I that I flagged for our IT person who is who is helping us. Uh, I mean, we, and we're in the beginning stages of 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 acquiring our new case management system, but but that's the very question that I flagged for him because we don't obtain this data directly from the individual. The data is most typically relayed to us through law enforcement. So if law enforcement is um, not consistently collecting and reporting the data to us, we don't necessarily have the data to relay. So I think that there's going to have to be some coordination with law enforcement as well to make sure they understand the importance of this particular data point and do their make their best efforts to collect it while at the same time respecting the privacy rights of anybody who may not want to provide it uh, to law enforcement. So. I think that there are some potentially tricky implementation questions like that that we're going to have to iron out. But at a minimum, I think we can take steps to make sure that it, that we report it on a more consistent basis. So, well, I can pipe up on that too. Uh, currently, the past version of the big, uh, I'm sorry, of the judiciary miscellaneous bill as in Section 31, a report by the Chief Superior Judge on collection of racial data in civil court filings. And so I'm charged with coming up with a report uh, that shall describe whether and in what manner data about the race of parties in civil court actions, including eviction and debt collection proceedings, is collected by the courts in Vermont and other jurisdictions. The report may include recommendations for future practices and strategies to collect racial democratic data or civil matters, and a copy of the report is also going to be sent to the woman who is right in the center of my screen at the bottom, Susanna Davis, uh, <laughs> Executive Director of Racial Equity. So that is that is a task that I have that is due by December 1st. Great. Thank you so much for that. Anyone else wanting weighing in on any of these issues right now? Rebecca. Responding to, to some of the things people brought up, um, Elizabeth, the language that you were you that got you are you are near back up a little bit, or, or maybe that's the wrong way. The, the offenders. I, I should have clarified that um, the language in, in the compilation of the reports was taken from um, most of it was taken from the reports directly. So, uh, and I, I'm not saying that I I didn't put that language <laughs> deliberately, but if I did, I don't want, I want uh, to be attributed as a final, because I agree with you. It wasn't scrubbed or presented as a way to indicate it was any of our personal uh, viewpoints. It was a way to share where this, you know, where these, where the recommendations were from those individual reports. Oftentimes that language was taken from there, lifted. Um, in terms of, of, of hearing about um, Evan, the prosecutors um, collecting race data and now grappling with the, the very critical next question and, and hearing Judge Zoni with the legislation on deck on the civil side. I just wanted to, you, you probably already know, um, Evan, certainly, uh, the work, the data, the subcommittee for the data project, we grappled with that very question, right? Um, who who was who was sharing? We talked. Monica's talked about it in terms of, in, on the DOC side, and it wasn't just the subcommittee on data reporting, but it's come up in several different places and times on our panel. What's the best approach? I recall people coming and presenting to us um, 
experts who research. Hey, Abby, if it wasn't you, maybe it's Dr. Sanguano or someone else from CRG, or maybe all three, about what has been done in their re respect reporting. So I think these are critical questions. Um, you know, lots of that. I think where our subcommittee landed was like, well, that, that's, that's, we can provide some input, but ultimately, what you're trying to get at the other side of it sort of drives the question of from whose perspective is reporting and identifying the race, right? Um, and Evan, I just wanted to point out, like as, as you're as you're as you're touching down uh, in terms of identifying race in your data systems, what I also have liked is this consideration within certain prosecution offices to strip police affidavits of trying to present it and as much of, of eliminating references to race so that it can be when considered by the prosecuting attorney at the time of charging um trying to again a theory being that can we remove some of the biases that may be implicit or explicit entering into the equation of what charges to charge based on if, if there's an obvious race because it's clearly identified or implicitly identified in and the materials that go into it. Um, so I don't know if that's been part of the discussion, Evan. I like that that is that race consciousness is entering. I just think it's it's this it's a start. And there's a lot of interesting thoughts about it being proposed in all these different prosecution offices. I'm sure you're familiar with. Again, another subcategory of our report that we shared with everyone. Witchy. Yeah, so it's just like a note that I um, and and I know we were going to discuss it during new, new business, but this sort of like considering you were talking about data collection and police and stuff, uh, something that was brought up to me by uh, Sheriff Anderson in Wyndham County is how that how uh, law enforcement is collecting data um, and very specifically citing um, and forgive me, I do not know how to read act names but 20 vsa 2366 if that means anything to anyone uh but essentially it's it's the it's the bill that's supposed to like have law enforcement collect data and stuff uh, around race and ethnicity and specifically they sort of showed me that the way that they're collecting race and ethnicity first of all is only uh the drivers um and second that they're not allowed to ask for uh race and ethnicities uh and third that then um what they actually put into the system is their perceived perceived race and then that that is what is sent uh to get analyzed and that sort of there's a lot of red flags for me there. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to point that out. And I don't know if it's worth bringing Sheriff Anderson in to 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 give us a presentation on it or whatever. But um, but that sort of that was brought up to me. So when we talk about analyzing and having law enforcement uh, collect uh, race and ethnicity data, I think that like I'm not sure if we're trying. I'm just not sure if anybody has reviewed it from that point of view. Well, which it's it's come up actually a fair amount, but I, it, 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 mm -hmm. and it continues to come up. Um, what the issue being that the person in power who has the power to detain, um, to you know, to arrest, to all those things, is the person whose biases are under are being questioned. And mm. so that is one of the issues that's come up around um, the race data collection, certainly around traffic stops. Mm. Um, how one self-identifies is another issue. Because I you're see. not giving um, yourself a ticket. Right. I, I think... I think sort of my my worry is um, what uh, so if we're asking police officers to perceive and assume the race, then I feel like that's an exercise in reinforcing biases. Um, and if it's to collect information about biases, then there's sort of like some possible thing that we can explore there. But if but if we're consistently asking them just guess the race, then it's literally just like 
reinforcing here's an exercise and you have to do your bicep over, over and over and over and over and over and then not create some sort of like some my feeling is that that's how you train someone to have biases so i just i have a really big sort of red flag about how that what kind of implicit training that is providing for a law enforcement to have those biases that's that's my concern Witchy, okay. i just want to say thank you i have been saying that for like four years apparently i've not been articulating it the way that you have but yes 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 and more yes it needs to stop anyone else Okay. Can I, sorry, can, I'm sorry. Can I, can I just ask a follow-up question on that? What is that data then used for that we collect on that perceived race? What, what is analyzed on that? It is possible at that, after getting that data to look at individual officers who may have, um, may seem to have, no whose work evidences disparity. So in other words, they seem to have pulled over or whatever um, an inordinate number of um, people of color, um, have perhaps ticketed them, um, have searched their cars, have looked for contraband, any number of those things. If those, when those people are identified, they have been um, then called in to speak with the majors, and, these, and I'm speaking here about the state police, about why it is that the disparities show up, because disparities do not immediately equal racism. Um, and there is a further investigation based on the data that we're talking about into why those disparities show up in certain people's work. Got it. That is insightful and it's and it's and it seems like the bias is used to monitor bias. That analysis may uh, make sense in my brain. Um, and having and and that issue that I brought up is also an issue and I would I would recommend that either us or a subgroup or something uh, take a look at sort of is this the best way to collect the data to monitor that bias and like thinking about just just thinking about that 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 impact that we're having um and addressing it that that, that that's it for me I swear thank you <laughs> okay chief quick question to follow up on that if if somebody I mean, if you're thinking common sense wise, if an officer is called into an office because he's indicated race a lot, you know, like it might show bias, wouldn't officers pick up on that pretty quick and stop saying, putting race or put unknown or just put something because they know that if they stop too many people that are of a certain race are gonna be called into the office and questioned? I, I'm just thinking like, from a common sense standpoint, I mean, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out that if you're called into an office because you're checking race too much, that that might, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just asking, is that, is that an avoidance of, are we capturing things? Are we actually capturing the things we need? Because is everybody filling that out? Or is that a mandatory um, type of feel, you know what I'm, it is I'm mandatory. Doing. Okay. I was just curious because you would think that officers would catch on after a while that people are getting pulled in the office saying, why are you biased? Because you stopped too many people of this, that they would stop indicating it or they would, or they would, I don't know. I don't know. I was just curious. Um, okay. When you said, when you said that's what it's used for. Um, I agree that, you know, they should be questioned, but I'm just trying to figure out how accurate that would be. That's all. Bar. Yeah, so uh, Eitan and I actually go over that data uh, multiple times during the year. And uh, 
that's a sworn document, so they have to fill it out correctly. Um, if they make a mistake in perception, that's one thing. Um, but there's there's also uh, a checks and balances type thing. So those tickets are, are entered into our records management system, and there are people who go in and they actually look and they make sure that um, the race is going to match what, or the race ethnicity category is going to match what also is in the computer for um, previous interactions or post interactions like that so um but but it is a flawed system because it is based upon perception and that can be um really wrong but um we're at kind of at a loss of how to fix that because then what you know do we put people in the uh situation of asking and then you know how does that create a confrontation in itself and um so we're really trying to figure out a, a best way to do that and if anybody can figure that out or help us with that um that's something we'd really really be open to because we recognize it's a very flawed system but it is a sworn document and they have to fill it out correctly uh, thank you for clarifying that i i would have i would have thought that maybe a system that if someone is charged they either have to go to court or not that at the time of court they could indicate what the race is that removes it from the officer and i mean the prosecutor and or defense attorney is going to know what race that person is um and then it it removes it it's a more accurate accounting of what that what the person's race actually is instead of the officer trying to determine it and then the data could be backfilled from those those uh, those court records or whatever that uh, whatever that happens to be that removes it. I just thought that that might be a more accurate um, way of getting race and and anyway. Thanks. You answered my question. Thank you. Yeah, actually, um, it's only for the traffic stops that it's a perception um, for custodial arrest. Uh, that's part of what we have to enter into the system. Um, so I, I don't know about everybody else, but I always ask because I ask like hair color because it could be dyed. I ask about eye color because I could look at somebody and think hazel and it actually is green or, um, you know, some kind of brown or whatever. But um, I always ask and I think that's usually what uh, most of our troopers do. I'm not sure about the other officers, but when you're doing a custodial arrest, it is different. It's that's when you're able to inquire. Evan, your hand was up and then it went down. Do you really want it down? It was an erroneous button click on my part. My apologies. Oh, okay. Um, what I would like to do at this moment, given that it is 725, it, we have thrown so much out. It's like, it's all out there. What do we need to do for next meeting? Have we identified any really, really vast areas that we need that we want to look at more specifically? I mean, one thing is clear that this, I mean, as Rebecca has said, this is a living document. People should be adding to it. And that should just be a task that is ongoing, I would suggest. Um, but I would all, and certainly it will be as this biennium comes to a close. Um, but uh, certainly the issues around the juvenile justice system, it's a big area um, that needs to be addressed. Um, what are other areas right now that we, where do we want to go for May 10th? Given what's gone on over the last hour and a half, where do we want to go for May 10th? Well, we are hearing rumors that by May 10th, the legislature hopes to have wrapped up already. So by our next meeting, it is possible that any pending legislation that affects us will already have passed, which means we should have a concrete understanding of where our limits are, what we're willing to do, what work we're not willing to take on, et cetera, before our next meeting, because we won't have a chance to provide further input by the time that happens. Sounds good. So I would perhaps just waiting is not a bad idea. 
I would also throw out there that that it seems to be developing um, at least it sounds like multiple multiple areas of interest are, yes. are being discussed. And I wonder if focusing more on the structure of things that we we can land on agreeing to set up subcommittees around these uh, interest areas and then use the next month or more for those subcommittees to go deeper on those subjects. And I was, here, here. Um, you know, Julio, I'm going to credit a conversation we had earlier this week or last week, I can't remember now. Um, we were talking about sort of, and you've brought it up, Julio, in other meetings here at the panel, bringing, you know, bringing in experts on these subject matters, maybe they'll they'll come and talk to us for free. Maybe we can find some way for the AGO to fund this, for their travel to come talk to us. Maybe we can get enough people together so we can actually combine this um, with a conference. Again, not my idea, but I will share it here because I think it's really a great, it's a smart idea. And, and the point being is that these subcommittees can spend more time Go deeper and and find out more. Like, great. Right, where is the thinking? Where is the spread? Um, for me, I you know I'm already working um, on the second look stuff for sentencing commission. So I, I'll throw my hat in and signing up and suggesting um, that category of subcommittee here on this panel. Um, great. Right. Um, Grant, wherever you are, because I can't see you. Make sure you've got this written down because I'm going to really need to know who's doing what. Um, again, I feel like I'm volunteering people, but um, I guess Tyler, you and Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you and Tyler were talking about looking at this and plugging in the stuff around. Um, uh, good God, I'm having an aphasia moment here. The juvenile justice system. Absolutely. So I would say that that's one other subcommittee here. Ab absolutely, and I would just say, I mean, I know this is a PDF document, um, but uh, if 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 somebody can pass off a Word document to me, I can edit it. And I would think that anything we add would probably be in a distinct section of its own because it doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily fit into any of these categories, but we might have some ideas in any given one. Great. So we've got the second look, we've got stuff up JJ system. Aaron. I'm wondering, do we have an RDAP website other than what's our public facing website where we post minutes and, and members and agenda? agenda? No. I think we need one. If we're going to have living documents that we all want to add to and maybe subcommittee folders and whatnot, um, Aton, would you like me to make like a SharePoint site where sure. we can all have access and add to documents and whatnot? And can, and people from, from that are not in state government have access to SharePoint? As far as I know, anybody that you invite to the SharePoint uh, place <laughs> can okay. as long as, the, as long as you tell them that it's an external SharePoint site and you're going to have okay. external. Right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Monica. I mean, I'll get I, help with this on my from my office. As you can tell, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Other than <laughs> um, it'd be nice to have a place in the cloud where we can all um, share and add to documents and materials. Great. I just Great. want to say from having access government SharePoint files from not being a government employee, it's really finicky. And I'm going to tell you right now, a bunch of people are going to have a lot of problems if, you're, okay. if they're not state employees. Um, and are there any suggestions for a better way? I don't, I really don't know. It's not my area of expertise. I don't got solutions, just problems for you, Erin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had well, this I conversation think... before, and one of the problems yeah. is that we're um, people recommending Google Docs, which is problematic for those of us who work for the state who are technically not allowed to do our work on Google Docs. So that's where we run into challenge. And I know SharePoint's 
finicky for people who work for the city too, Richie. So everybody gets well, to have that pleasure. What about, a, what about like, a, we are on a Teams meeting. We're all putting stuff in a Teams chat. We can have a team and you can post documents to your team. For Teams, it's even harder for outside oh. people because then you have to have, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I wish I didn't know no, all stuff. No, I'm um, glad you know it. For Teams, outside Side parties have to have a part an at partner account at the state, ah. which is even harder. So SharePoint's easier to get external people into than Teams. Okay, it might have to be SharePoint, and but I'll look into if there's a, a better, smarter, easier way. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a couple subcommittees going on here. Um, I mean, and then there's, of course, Evan and I are still, I mean, we're sort of holding back, but I, I mean, we're gonna, I would imagine, Evan, am I speaking for you, but that we're gonna keep going with what we were required to do as a panel in regard to the Criminal Justice Council um, by Act 54 of 2017. So I guess we're going to keep going with that now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to help with that. I think it might help to brainstorm how we proceed, given, you know, what's going on with the council. I was not able to sure. attend the last meeting. I understand one of the things that was supposed to have been discussed, although I don't know if it was was the uh, the recommendations from the training advisory committee concerning level two certification requirements and some of those training things. So I think that the council is moving forward with its reevaluation of its basic training and certification requirements, but not in the method that I thought it was going to be. I think it might be a, a subcommittee led approach. Okay. Um, but we can uh, maybe maybe you and I can connect and figure out and Absolutely. Susanna as well, um, figure out what's going on with that and whether it makes sense for us to continue down this path or or to or to back off. OK, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's a fair amount of stuff right there. Um, what I will do. Is get. When I when Grant gets the minutes to me, I'll send out an email about which what subcommittees exist, who's sort of the coordinator for them. And then I'm going to leave it to all of us who are panelists to plug ourselves in to help. OK, um, please don't leave people hanging. Just don't don't do it. Don't do it. There's a reason that not only do we have a panel, but that the panel has been expanded. So just, I'm not trying to be admonishing, I'm just begging. Um, don't don't leave people hanging. Everybody is so overworked, um, I know, but um, it, it we really need to have a collective approach to all of this. Um, is that all right? Can we leave that issue now? All right, Pepper, my friends. Hey, um, if you don't mind, I might just join on my laptop. I was on my phone, so I, I apologize. Um, let me just take one second here, if you don't mind. No, that's okay. Um, Sorry about that. Um, so uh, can everyone hear me OK? Yep. OK, great. Um, so just uh, once again, it's James Pepper um, with the, the I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, I used to have Evan's job and was a um, longtime member of the racial disparities panel. Um, and um, 
there's an issue uh, that's come up um, with the cannabis board that I wanted to run by this group just to hear your reaction, essentially. Um, you know, it's not something that needs to be resolved tonight by any means, um, but it is something that I think this particular panel has um, expertise in, so I figured I'd run it by, by you all. Um, and it ties in a lot of the kind of considerations and, and thought processes that I've heard tonight. Um, and I know uh, that you guys grapple with every month uh, and in between. So essentially, um, one of the tasks um, that the Cannabis Board has been presented with is um, trying to um, use our authority uh, in the cannabis industry to promote social equity. Um, and social equity has been defined for us by the legislature. Um, uh, they said that social equity are social equity applicants, um, which receive certain privileges um, under the cannabis laws, are um, people, um, individuals from communities that have been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition, or individuals directly and personally impacted by cannabis prohibition. And so um, they left it to the board to develop the very specific criteria um, as to how we define a community member who's been um, uh, disproportionately impacted or someone who's been personally disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. And um, if you qualify um, as a social equity applicant, um, then um, essentially you get expedited review by the board, um, you get prioritized by the board for review. So essentially we kind of stop our standard review whenever we receive an applicant or an application from a social equity applicant and move them to the top of the pile. Um, and um, we're allowed to waive and reduce uh, our licensing fees at the board um, for social equity applicants. And um, we uh, there's a community business development fund that's been created. It doesn't have a ton of money in it, but it's something. Um, it's got half a million dollars in it, and there's going to be additional contributions to that fund um, over time. And um, so the folks that are, have access to that money for kind of revolving loans or grants, um, what have you, um, are the people that qualify as a social equity applicant. So, um, you know, when the, bo the board uh, in dealing with social equity um, in this kind of definition, which is kind of a foundational question for us, we tried to kind of engage with community members. We formed a social equity subcommittee. We held town hall meetings around social equity. Um, we eventually came to, well, I should say the second prong is relatively straightforward. People who have been personally directly impacted by cannabis prohibition. So on that criteria specifically, we said, if you or a family member has been incarcerated for a cannabis related offense, and that can be relatively broad, um, then you have been personally um, or direct and directly impacted by cannabis prohibition. So, so that's kind of how we dealt with that second prong. Um, but the first prong is, you know, again, individuals from communities that have been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. That gets a little bit more challenging to define what is a community and how does a community kind of evolve over time. Um, and so other states have tried, attempted this uh, same exact task. Um, they've come up with something called disproportionate impacted, disproportionately impacted communities um, or disproportionately impacted zones. Essentially, they've looked at historic policing data and um, they've tried to go down to the kind of uh, policing district, not just kind of a broad zip code and looked for over enforcement of drug crimes and said, anyone who lives in this policing district, you know, we've seen disproportionate outcomes on drug crimes from this district. Um, you qualify as a social equity applicant. Um, we did this analysis in Vermont and it was not very fruitful. Um, essentially because of either the historical lack of data or the quality of the data um, or just kind of maybe small sample sizes, we were seeing just broad swaths of the state being disproportionate impact communities. We couldn't get down to kind of the 
either the zip code or the kind of policing district level. Uh, it just, you know, all of Addison County, all of Bennington County, all of Chittenden County are all, you know, disproportionate impact communities, whereas no one from, you know, Essex County or Washington County is. So it just didn't make a whole lot of sense for us to use that model. It was both kind of over-inclusive um, in that it included a lot of people that of course never have been impacted by cannabis prohibition and it excluded a lot of folks that probably would have been. Um, we looked at economic opportunity zones. Um, this is a federal tax incentive program um, that was created um, you know, a few years back. I can't remember the exact date, but they essentially, you know, the legislature and local communities developed these maps of areas that needed development, you know, maybe because of socioeconomic reasons, and you would get tax federal tax incentives for investing, doing projects in these in these areas. Again, a lot of arbitrary line drawing that was going on when we looked at that, those maps. Um, you know, essentially everything kind of south of Main Street and Barrie is an opportunity zone, whereas nothing north of Main Street is. And it just didn't make sense. And, and it leads in other states to a lot of gamesmanship. You know, a lot of Policing districts that maybe historically um, had over policing now have been gentrified. And now no one who currently lives in those districts actually has ever had any sort of disproportionate impact um, from the war on drugs. So we did um, something that uh, probably, you know, might not be wise um, in the long run, but we did what we felt was right, which is we, you know, from my work on this panel, from my work um, with the state's attorneys, from my work on the kind of uh, Justice Reinvestment 2 working group, we've seen sufficient data in my mind that um, black and brown communities have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Um, and we see it with the arrest decision, um, whether to arrest or to cite, um, we've seen it in charging decisions, we've seen it in sentencing, um, in, in incarceration lengths, um, and you know, for drug crimes and cannabis crimes. So we said for that first prong that if you are a African American, a Hispanic American, or um, you come from a community, however you want to define that, that has been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, by cannabis prohibition, then you qualify as a social equity applicant. And so the reason I'm here tonight is because we wanted to include that kind of catch-all language because we know that a lot of people have been harmed by the war on drugs or have come from communities that have, but we don't have necessarily the data to withstand a court challenge to that. Um, you know, whether it's LGBTQIA, whether it's women, whether it's um, uh, Indigenous Americans, First Americans, immigrants, um, it just, it, we, we didn't include a lot of demographic groups um, because we didn't feel like we had sufficient data to really demonstrate that disproportionate impact. But we left this kind of this kind of pressure release valve, you know, this ability to um, to become a social equity applicant if you can demonstrate that your community has been harmed. Um, and the definition of community is kind of, well, make a case to the board. Um, what is your community and why has it been harmed? Um, of course, the board is a three member unelected body and it felt wrong for us um, to be sitting in judgment on this very important issue um, you know, and have essentially not no other set of eyes on this. Um, so, you know, I put together a list of potential, um, groups that I thought might be a good kind of second review after the board has kind of done some initial work that might be able to kind of be the final, um, word on this or, you know, however we want to sequence it, however, whichever makes the most sense. You know, I thought about the, um, well, I thought about um, Susanna's office. I know, you know, your capacity is very limited. Everyone's capacity is very limited, but, you know, your capacity is certainly very limited. Um, I thought about the racial equity task force. Um, I thought about just kind of assembling a private, not private group, but just kind of a just interested stakeholder group. Um, but then, you know, I really thought that this is the body that when I served on it and, you know, what I've seen here tonight, that really understands 
the disproportionate impact on um, racial minorities and other communities. Um, and I thought that uh, perhaps I would pitch to this group that um, either you as a whole or maybe you as a subcommittee might be willing to review these kind of that third criteria. If you know someone who's not African American, not Hispanic American, but comes from a community and they're going to be presenting evidence, these applicants, as to why their community deserves um, to be considered as a social equity applicant, whether someone else in this group in particular or a subgroup of this of the RDAP would be willing to kind of help the cannabis board review some of those um, applications for that third prong. It's a lot of information I just laid out there. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about cannabis, cannabis policy, where we stand right now. But um, I wanted just to take the opportunity um, tonight to just throw that idea out there and see just what the kind of gut reaction is um, and if this is a path that we can pursue. Pepper, are you more helped at this by lawyers than you are by those of us who aren't? I would almost, you know, it's always good to have a diversity of opinion here. I almost, when I originally pitched this, thought that only the community appointed members would be the, the right subgroup. But then again, um, uh, I I'm not I'm not tied to that. I you know I I know that everyone is overworked. I know this is a volunteer organization. I know that you guys have you know the weight of you know if you just look at your enabling legislation, you have a monumental task. Um and it just feels like however um I can engage with this group uh or a sub subgroup of it, I feel like it would be a benefit to the board, it would be a benefit to the entire social equity um kind of aspect to what we're trying to do at the cannabis board. So the answer is whatever, whatever, whatever help you can provide, we would take it. Um, okay. Chief. Um, I personally pepper, I would not be on one of those boards because, uh, how do I tell my constituents or the people indigenous, they have not been harmed enough or it pits one minority against another. You know, like I'm making a decision on who has been harmed enough or who is or who isn't, which creates animosity amongst the community, um, because whatever happens here also spirals out into the community. So I'm just saying as me, I wouldn't put myself in a position of judging who could have this license and who couldn't that's of another race or even my own constituency to go back and explain that they're, you know, they, they don't qualify. So I'm just saying is for me being in my role, I would not be on that board personally. Um, and I don't know anybody in my community that would want to do that. So I'm just giving you my feedback. Um, because it, it does cause, I don't want to say race issues, but we're already having enough problems in Vermont already. We don't want to, you know, divide people because of that. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And it was the biggest reason why I felt like maybe this is not the best approach to take when we came up with the kind of race-based criteria or non-race, non-ethnic neutral criteria um, was that very point. Um, it just, I mean, the legislation is what it is. It says people from communities who have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis and every other kind of attempt at defining that did not actually capture what the data shows. And so it's a very, un I agree 100% that we're, we were kind of in a bad position here that might have the unintended con consequence of inflaming um, kind of racial tensions um, or ethnic tensions. And I, and I, I recognize that. Um, but um, I would just say that harm and community, those two words, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot to unpack there and hearing people's individual stories on this you know, isn't meant to kind of inflame that, but I, I, I understand sitting in judgment and saying, no, not enough harm there, or that's not really a community, uh, you know, is going to be tough. Rebecca. Pepper, it's so good to hear you. I'm glad you're here tonight and, and sharing these, these, um, these ideas. 
Um, so welcome back anytime. Uh, we, we miss you. Uh, but I'm with the chief here. And uh, certainly as a panel member, I, I would I would just be opposed to us sitting in, in judgment. It sounds like that's the role you would want us to play in this sort of a second reviewer. What you're proposing sounds like you're putting the burden the, on the applicant, the person who is purportedly of these historically disadvantaged communities to prove themselves to be a part of it, which is a premise that I don't even, I, I understand your challenge and what you're asking us, but to me, if, if it sounds like you're, you're, if you're looking, I would just approach it from how to how to get the most broadly defined um, definition that you can be um, that's consistent with the statutory language, and and go from there. But uh, I certainly don't want RDAP to be to be in that role. Uh, Aton, you know, I, I between Pepper's yes. proposal and Senate Judiciary's and and the legislature's insistence that that we default to RDAP to do all these things, I am starting to shift my position on this. Maybe we should embrace and turn RDAP into a government and or some kind of entity, independent entity, and just get the funding and resources so we become fully permanently staffed, so we can <laughs> maybe quit our jobs and and, and join this. Maybe that's we should embrace this. If if everyone's pushing this on to us, whether it's bad, I'm I'm joking, but I'm sort of not. I, no, My I point is, is that <laughs> like we need a prom if we need RDAP to be a permanent entity, because increasingly we are being this useful. Um, and then then perhaps that's what the legislature should do. But uh, sure. thank you, Pepper, <laughs> for coming. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. Sheila. Uh, thank you, Aton. Um, and hi, Pepper. How you doing? Um, hey, yeah, hey. I just wanted to basically say I agree with the chief and I agree with Rebecca. That's all I was going to say because I was um, waiting for people to talk because I was trying to figure out like more than just showing up. What do I have to do for me and my community? Like I, I just is like mind boggling because I mean, I mean, I know that hasn't always been that representation for people to understand how certain communities have been harmed. And I also feel like some of that is common sense. And um, so I just feel like I feel very similar to what Rebecca and Chief said and feel like as a person who identifies as a black person, like more than just showing up, what do I have to do? Because uh, I mean, I, I just, I just don't, I don't really understand the assignment, I guess, you know, in a way, because it just sounds, it sounds, I, I'm appreciative of the work and the thoughts and the creativity. And I'm just like, I'm perplexed by um, how we keep finding our, ourselves in those spaces that I'm going to go with unintentionally has a, a problematic purpose of creating more harm. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if the if the charge was only, you know, look for people that have been directly personally impacted by cannabis prohibition, our job would be a lot easier. It's the second prong that really, you know, makes things very complicated. Um, and, uh, you know, it, you're right that it, it again, it has the possibility of further kind of and moving in the wrong direction. Um, and we're trying to kind of think about how to alleviate that or, or thread that needle. Okay. Sheila? No, I was just trying to take my hand down. Oh, okay, okay. Um, Pepper, I think, I think, oh, Chief, go ahead. Uh, one quick thing I want to mention to Pepper that it's not really my place to say this, um, but you may want to change the definition from African-American to Black, because I've been corrected many times by saying not everybody is of African descent. They could be from another country or Jamaica or some other. I just want to, that is kind of a minor thing, and it's not my place to say it, but I'll leave it up to the uh, communities here at large, if they how they would refer to that. Um, because sometimes language matters. And I just yeah. want to make sure that um, I, I said that. Uh, I, I apologize ahead of time for speaking, you know, where it's not my place to speak, so. Ching. Yeah, I, I uh, agree with what everyone uh, already said. I just wanted to 
kind of it's not really a suggestion, but more like a question. Is it possible just to make a case to whoever you need to make a case to by extrapolating the research or data from other states to um, Vermont? Although we, you know, we we our uh, data here is there are a lot of issues with the, you know the sample size and you, based on what you already did, um, but like. It's it's really like a common sense that people of color or um our or our people of color communities are uh, generally affected more by uh, the drug war, and so I I think it's probably okay to just extend it to the whole BIPOC community of Vermont. Uh, well, given that we are what we already know, and also Vermont has a very small, currently very small BIPOC population. So I just I'm just wondering um, how many more applicants that like how restricted the resources is to in order to serve the whole BIPOC community here instead of dividing up like which groups and which which areas are eligible to apply. It's a good question. Yeah. So we did discuss that, and and just um, just one. Thing that I would mention also is that you know while you have to be a Vermont resident currently to um, own a Vermont cannabis license, you know you can establish residency very quickly. So and we can't exclude out of staters from this. So you know if we say BIPOC here, it's BIPOC for uh, you know anyone who applies. Um, but uh, you know the in. I don't want to get too kind of out of my depth here, but really, you know, someone's going to challenge this determination in court. Someone's going to say that they were harmed by not being a BIPOC member or not being um, not being in a, a black American, a Hispanic American, um, and they're not being a social equity applicant because of that. And really, you know, what we have to demonstrate at the board is that there is a compelling um, government interest here to that we are trying to correct. And unfortunately, you know, I we certainly would accept any data fr from that's national data um, that shows that other, you know, indigenous groups, first Americans, uh, Southeast Asians, anyone um, has been harmed um, by the war on drugs, but we need to be able to show that there is this kind of compelling government need that we need to alleviate, um, that we need to kind of, that we can make certain privileges in order to um, kind of, to kind of change. Um, so while we certainly um, are going to, th that third, ca that third catch-all category is you're from a community that's been harmed, is meant to kind of bring in folks um, that have been, that can demonstrate this harm. But, um, you know, as far as I can tell, the kind of overwhelming data suggests that Black Americans and um, kind of Latino, Latina, Latinx Americans have been, there's, there's at least compelling data there that can help demonstrate this government interest. Witchy, and I'm just letting us know it is eight o'clock. Um, maybe another uh, point that you could come at this from, uh, and I'm sorry if this got said already, uh, but is comparing um, sort of race and ethnicity for incarceration um, regarding drug use um, or even other other categories for drug for drug use or distribution to, to sell um, compared to uh, what who was able to open stores and join in in that industry in places that have had this. Because, um, for example, uh, coming having come from Massachusetts, I know like right off the bat, that type of person that was able to get in that door to have that. So I think if we're looking for a, gov for a reason that you can convince the government to incentivize that correction. It could be looking at what's already happened and how uh, this, the, these disparities have led to sort of more of a uh, disparity. I don't know if that made sense, I'm sorry. No, it's, okay. it is helpful, yeah. I, Eitan, I recognize the time. Um, what I would just say to anyone is if anyone wants to just share their thoughts or, you know, I, it sounds to me like it's probably not going to work out to kind of have, um, you know, RDAP 
take this on. And I know your hands are completely full at the moment, but if anyone has any thoughts or things that they want to share with me, you know, it's just my first name, dot my last name at vermont.gov, or you can always call me. I'll, I'll put my cell phone in the chat. Great. Thanks, Pepper. Thank you. Okay. Um, the other issue I can, I'll handle by email. I'll just do it by email. It's I, it, it's fine. I'll deal with it that way. You all get an email. Next meeting is the 10th of May. Um, you all know what you're going to be doing for that. Um, may we adjourn? See, I wasn't doing Robert's rules there. I was just asking you. May we adjourn? Yes. yes. Rebecca, yes. stop. Thank you. <laughs> yes. all right, done, we're like, what do we do? <laughs> I know. Wasn't it? We were all really confused. Um, I've been getting yelled at, so I thought I'd like get done with it. Um, everybody, bye. Talk thank to you, you next time. Bye. Emails bye. coming. Be well. Thank you all for just amazing work. And I really want to, again, say the JRX team, you guys rock. Um, to produce this beginning of a document is just awesome. So thank you. And thanks to everybody else for the um, really productive conversation and all the work that everyone's always doing. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.